Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the Wheeler Centre, the Fifth Estate at the Wheeler Centre. Um, and it is a very special Fifth Estate tonight because we're here with Reprieve Australia. But just uh, some brief comments that Reprieve... Uh, well, Reprieve Australia was started by Richard Burke, actually, and it's a, a legal and humanitarian... Um, assistance organisation for people facing the death penalty. My name's Sally Warhaft and uh, it's a real um, uh, honour tonight to be uh, chairing this session with three such eminent uh, and compassionate human beings. Richard Burke is a lawyer, they're all lawyers, uh, <laughs> and the director of the Louisiana Capital Assistance Centre. Uh, which is an advocacy and representation body that's based in New Orleans, one of the death penalty centres of the United States, I suppose, but changing, and we'll hear a bit more about that. Um, and as I said before, he's the co-founder of Reprieve Australia. He is a Melbourne lad. Uh, come home this week. Gillian Triggs is the president of the Australian Human Rights Commission and uh, she took up her appointment in 2012 and prior to that she was a distinguished academic and barrister. And Lex Lazary uh, is of course a judge in the Supreme Court of Victoria and a long-time advocate of the abolition of the death penalty and uh, you will remember that he, uh, with Julian McMahon and many others, uh, uh, represented uh, Van Nguyen, who was executed in Singapore in 2005. Lex was also on the team initially uh, uh, representing uh, Myron uh, Sukumaran and Andrew Chan, uh, which he was forced to leave uh, when he became a judge, but he remained in very close contact um, with the you know, goings on and in fact uh, was in Bali several times uh, earlier this year as was I uh, visiting them and, uh, and trying to offer what support he could, great support for their families. Please give uh, our panel a very warm Wheeler welcome. So uh, tonight um, we're not um, here to talk about Myron and, and Andrew. We're here to talk about what next uh, with everything that's happened uh, up to and since the 29th of April in Australia. What can Australia do? What role can Australia possibly play uh, in becoming a better advocate against the death penalty in our region and around the world? And... Uh, uh, I know that this is a conversation that uh, Maya and Andrew deeply uh, wanted to occur and wanted to continue. So I thought um, we should start with something, you know, vaguely positive, I suppose, and in fact very positive, which um, is the, the three distinct advantages that I think Australia has in relation to the death penalty uh, this, this trio. We have bipartisan support in our parliament uh, and in fact in all parliaments in Australia. We have legislation nationwide against the death penalty. There hasn't been an execution in Australia since Ronald Ryan in 1967. And we're also a signatory to the United Nations second optional protocol. Uh, to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, which specifically aims at the abolition of the death penalty. And we can talk a little bit more about what that means. But I thought I'd, I'd uh, start by asking each of you what that means, that advantage that Australia has those three things together. Perhaps, Richard, you'd like to start off. Well, I think... I think that definitely helps, and I'm not worried about having to come back to Australia to fight death penalty cases in Australia. We're not reintroducing the death penalty, and that's good. Uh, as far as advantages in the region and taking a role in advancing abolition in the region and worldwide, they are advantages, 
but only in a limited sense, in that we couldn't get out of the, the starting box without that. But they're not sufficient. I think we have to be very careful in our role, particularly in the region, of uh, getting up on a, a moral high ground and telling other people what to do. We can't make anyone in this region abolish the death penalty. We can only persuade people to do it. And the thing that struck me about Australia's position, and something this is something that happened to me in my work in the US, uh, one of the things we go and do is we go and interview jurors who've been on trials and voted to kill our clients. These are people who obviously believe in the death penalty and have voted for death. And in a case many years ago, we had a lot of trouble getting this juror to, to sit still and, and talk to us, and he eventually did. Uh, told us a very interesting story about what happened during the trial and what have you. And at the end he said, I didn't want to meet with you. The only reason that I sat and talked with you is because you obviously believe deeply in what you're doing. And I think that for us, for Australia to have a voice that is persuasive in the region, that's how we need to carry ourselves forward. So the bits of paper are okay, but we need to have a consistent honest opposition to the death penalty and then speak respectfully to our neighbours about why we believe that and would like to share that with them and have them come to a similar view. Yes, I agree with that. I think the first question is whether Australia as a country wants to argue the toss in the South Pacific um, or in Asia generally about the death penalty, whether we've really got the stomach for it, whether we really care enough about it. Um, it's one thing to have the kind of emotional discussions we've had leading up to the death of uh, Andrew Chan and uh, Myron Sukumaran because it's against an emotional backdrop and everyone gets emotional. But that was the 29th of April. Uh, we're now nearly to the end of May. The story's gone. It's not in the papers anymore. No one's talking about the death penalty. And I think we as a country and the government, as a government of this country, needs to decide do we really want to do something about this or are we just going to wait until next time? And then go through, go through this emotional charade where um, everyone's boxed into a corner. In, this, in the Bali case, of course, the Indonesian government were committed. They were boxed in. Uh, Jakawi was committed and boxed in and uh, was never going to be persuaded, as in the Van Nguyen case in Singapore. We need to have, and I agree with Richard, we need to have a genuine discussion where the object of the exercise is to bring an intellectual argument to these countries and persuade them to a different point of view. And that can't wait until next time someone's facing the death penalty. We're going to come back to all of this. Gillian? Well, I agree with everything that's been said, but I do actually think that rather paradoxically, uh, the deaths of Andrew Maruren has been possibly a basis on which Australia can say we stood up in a bipartisan way mm. and we can now, with credibility, move into the region uh, to promote an end to the de a death penalty, or at least a moratorium, and, and the region loves to act in stages, a moratorium would be a reasonable thing to, to try for. But I think the point also needs to be, or two points really need to be recognised. One is that the death penalty is carried out um, more frequently in this region than in any other part of the world. But secondly, and much more positively, uh, many countries within the Asian Pacific region have been moving over the last few years to either a moratorium or uh, relatively frequently um, uh, commuting uh, sentences uh, or reducing the very high number of offences which attract the death penalty mm -hmm. and confining them to, very, to a relatively small number. So I, I do believe that the time is oddly ripe where we've got a, a, a movement in the region uh, in, in de facto uh, not to carry out the death penalty. And we've got, I think, a credible position uh, on the part of Australia to take a leadership role. Now, we do, of course, have to be extremely careful that we're not seen as shaking the finger at others and telling them what to do. But I think on this issue, we do have a credible position. And mercifully, it's a bipartisan position, which has been one of the rays of light through this, uh, these rather dark days. Is that trend that you talk about, quite rightly, the, th the thing that makes it different to when Van was executed? Because I remember the momentum, the feeling yep. that something would change was there when Van was mm. executed. We, we went it, through this whole thing with Van Nguyen. It was three years instead of ten years, but um, if you go back and look at the interviews we did at the time about the rehabilitation he went through, 
Um, it was less spectacular than um, Myron and Andrew because it was over a shorter time, but there was no question he was fully rehabilitated. We, we talked about the government leading a discussion in the region after his execution about the death penalty, nothing. That was 10 years ago. And if I may say, and I hate to be the negative voice, um, but you know, there's another 50 or 60 people who are likely to be executed in Indonesia over the next 12 months. So what are we going to do about that? Um, what are we going to be saying about that? What are we saying about, about um, the Boston bomber um, uh, and cases like that? I mean, we really have to have, it seems to me, a genuinely credible position that people will respect. But it's only, I mean, you, when you say what are we going to do about that, it's not like Australia is going to send in the gunboats. No, no, or no. I'm, like I'm just talking. No, I'm just talking about an expression of, uh, you know, right. interest, um, a debate right. about it, and, and to go back to your starting point, trying to develop a discussion in which Australia participates about why this shouldn't be persisted. I, I agree. We can't just say right. We're going to stop this. Right. And, in and in I mean, we come. And we're not going to <laughs> announce trade sanctions. No. no. And, and I think we have to get our own house in order. I mean, yes, it's bipartisan. But the Australian Federal Police will still put people's heads on the chopping yeah. block. I mean, I remember when this whole saga started 10 years ago, the position the Australian Federal Police put themselves in, and it was disgraceful. And for every press interview they've done since, they, I, to my mind, they look worse every time. And that's about civilian leadership. You can't ask law enforcement agencies to act anything other than like law enforcement agencies. But if we're serious that we're opposed to the death penalty and we think it's wrong as a country and we're not going to support it and we've signed the second optional protocol, then we can't de facto engage in it. It's like the US engaging in rendition to countries that, that uh, participate in torture. You're either in or you're out. And it wouldn't be the end of uh, law enforcement cooperation in the region by any means and it wouldn't flood Australia with eight kilograms of pure heroin when heroin usage in Australia is estimated in pure terms, in, in, it's measured in tonnes, not kilograms. I mean, if we're serious about it, then we, we draw a line and say we're not going to participate in it respectfully. And if you will work with us, anyone we help you catch, you agree not to kill and we're, we're good. We'll share all our intelligence and we'll work together. But to do that, does it not require absolute consistency and taking opportunities. So, you know, you've got John Howard with the Bali bombers and um, his, right. his response when questioned about that uh, was, um, w w he said, uh, if they were not executed, the Bali bombers, I think that it would be very, very bad. And he was taken to task on his inconsistency and his response was, I know, I'm being inconsistent. I will advocate and fight for Australians on death row, but these guys should be executed. There have been examples uh, from leaders on all sides, actually, of, of that, that's probably the most recent and best known. Um, so inconsistency like that, it seems to me that could be fixed if there was a real will. And then, I suppose, a taking opportunity so that you've got the foreign minister this week that perhaps could have dropped in a line about, you know, we've been talking a lot about the death penalty in this country. She was clearly incredibly moved by her involvement in, in Bali. Uh, you know, the Boston bomber, you know, isn't it a shame? Isn't it a shame this persists with our greatest ally? But what's the policy? I mean, what's the government policy? Where's the government saying, all right, well, we've learned something about the death penalty from this case, and we are now going to actively uh, promote uh, um, an abolition of the death penalty in the region. We're going to speak to our neighbours, and this is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to argue the case. I I'm not hearing any policy like that, Gillian, and it's all do you very well. For... Do you see any sign that that actually could happen in government? Well, I, I think there's no no doubt that uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs policy, government policy, but executed through the Department of Foreign Affairs, has insisted on this, but behind the scenes in the diplomatic context, and um, I happen to know that that's the case and has been for quite a long time, the government and DFAT officials have been very strong on that. But the trouble is that it's not been the political public statement 
uh, that I think we need. And what might be different, and I, I completely respect the, the experience that... Uh, bring that, bring the, your mic in a bit. I, I respect the experience that we've, we've clearly had in the past and those really quite shocking and inconsistent statements by the, by the former Prime Minister. But we have to think positively about the future. This is a new opportunity, even if 10 years from now we'll say it doesn't work. We've got to give it a try. Uh, so I think what we need is clearly political will but we do seem to have that political will with um, the foreign minister, uh, with Tony Plavisek, and with the public. And I think this is an opportunity for them to speak up. Now, it's very difficult for the foreign minister to say in the context of the um, Boston bomber, for example, uh, well, we, we, uh, you know, we think this is the wrong decision and that uh, the court is wrong and that the person should not be executed. That really does become an interference by a foreign minister. So there's got to be much more subtle ways of getting this policy across. Um, so I don't, I don't think that's the, the opportunity to do it. I think the opportunity to do it is through um, our regional organisations, uh, work through ASEAN, get it on the agenda for Chogham in, uh, later this year. Uh, another uh, avenue that perhaps I would uh, want to recommend is uh, national human rights bodies. Um, throughout, the, there are 28 national human rights commissions in our region, uh, and they support the end of the death penalty. And we've been working with Komisan, for example, in Indonesia. Now, we're a long way from, from being a major leader in the area, but nonetheless, I think at various levels, it's possible to build on this momentum. This time, perhaps to hope that we get much more public commitment at the political level, uh, that we have champions. And I think one thing we, not, we need to work on, for example, is parliament. Uh, parliament was, was out there. Um, maybe it was a political gesture. Where, let's see what it really means. But why don't we work with all our backbenchers and parliamentarians to see if we can get a parliamentary union support for this and then work with our, with our region and with our, with our colleagues. Malaysia, for example, has come out very strongly now against the death penalty and there's a meeting, a regional meeting, hosted by Malaysia to consider a, 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 a moratorium uh, in early June. So these are, these are sort of green shoots of opportunity that may, may, may wither. But I think we should grasp them and move as quickly as we can, which is why I think tonight's uh, discussion is, is a useful one. Richard, the momentum in the world is going against this practice, um, as it is in America. In fact, overnight, Alaska uh, became the most, I think, conservative state in, in American Nebraska. history. Nebraska. Nebraska, sorry. Nebraska. Nebraska. Uh, to, close. Uh, <laughs> close, yeah. Well, uh, to uh, to uh, abolish uh, the death penalty. I mean, it's quite, that's quite remarkable, and it's on trend for the United States. It is. Tell us what you know, because I imagine it, the US has its own particularities with the death penalty, but what has worked in, in, in getting this trend in the right direction, but also worldwide? Well, it wasn't the Australian foreign minister saying anything. Um, so, I mean, this is where I... You know more about this stuff than I do anyway, Gillian. I'm just down in a trench with a, a shovel. Uh, I, don't, I don't rub shoulders with these people. I don't know how they work, but... Um, <laughs> I think I think the Australian. The question is today, but uh, I think the Australian Foreign Minister can say it. But I don't really care whether the Australian Foreign Minister says it every time a microphone is presented, mm. anyway, because that's not what's mm. going to mm. change anything. Mm. When you look at what's changed things in the US, uh, and you know we're talking about the most powerful, wealthiest nation in the world, you know they still have it, and. What's changed that is incrementally decision maker by decision maker, state by state, but within each state, district attorney by district attorney. Louisiana, where I live these days, has 42 district attorneys. Each one individually gets to decide whether to seek death in the case in their region of the state. You've got a lot of individual decision makers, but <coughs> progressively, individual decision makers decide not to seek death, then you move to a position like Nebraska. And one of the things that's moved that there is information. You've got to have a reason to get rid of it. The single greatest shift, the single, if you picked out one thing in the last 20 years, is the exonerations, which started with DNA and then continued as exonerations built around investigation of these wrongful convictions. People thought their system worked and then they found out that it didn't. The exposure of racism and other forms of corruption uh, in that system. The exposure of the unfairness of a system where uh, the government that's trying to kill you 
is the most powerful and richest government in the world and you're given this tiny little pot of resources with which to defend your client and the unlikelihood that that will produce a fair or accurate outcome in an adversarial system. I would like to see, uh, whilst people are going to Chogham meetings that I'll never be invited to and don't understand how they work, I think something like organisations like Reprieve Australia and the people in this room and listening to this are able to do is participate in that sort of informational stuff. In this last wave of executions in Indonesia, there was uh, a gentleman who was obviously very seriously mentally ill. Mm. All right, maybe you're not going to abolish, but we, can we at least agree not to kill the people who are so severely mentally ill? Well, that's um, in the Indonesian constitution that they shouldn't <coughs> do that. So. And so how often is it happening? Who's over there counting? Who's looking at death row? Who's checking on those people and publicising that fact? That's been one of the great successes in the US is to go and dig out the information and expose the level of racism, expose the number of intellectually disabled on death row, expose the number of mentally ill, uh, and those sorts of things. No government wants to be proud of that, and that gives them a reason coming from the ground up rather than the top down, which I know nothing about, uh, to, to, to decide to get rid of. So that advocacy from the ground up in Louisiana, your state, there hasn't been an execution, is it five years? Is it there, there's only been two executions in Louisiana. There's been a bunch of death sentences, but there's only been two executions in the last 12 years. And the last one was what we call a, a death row volunteer, someone who said, I don't want to appeal. I don't want to do life without parole in prison. I'd rather if you killed me now, who in fact retained a civil rights lawyer to advocate for his right to be immediately executed. Now, so. Louisiana is a place that loved the death penalty. This is why That's you true. set up there. So has the success there, uh, I mean, it's obviously had a lot to do with your centre and that advocacy. Uh, do we need these centres in you know, every state, every country, uh, where the death penalty flourishes? Well, I think we do. I think it's about building capacity to do two things. One is to provide skilled, experienced, meaningful representation to people who are in this position. And that takes different forms in different countries and different legal systems. But the other is to have, again, an infrastructure of people who are there advocating, gathering this data, holding the system accountable. You know, the single most important uh, sort of apocryphal story for us doing death penalty work is the emperor's new clothes. You need to call out the system for being as flawed as it is. And I, ha I, I have no reason to believe that the system as it operates in various countries in Southeast Asia is any better than that that I see in the US that I know intimately, and it's, it's worse. terrible. It's worse. Mm. Well, I mean, the big point at the end of this last case was whether or not uh, some way could be found to enforce a requirement on the president before he refused clemency to at least read the application. Um, That's not worse. Well, it's pretty bad. <laughs> That's Texas. You know, Texas yeah. Public Records Act requests demonstrated that the, the governor of Texas was essentially not yeah. making a meaningful review of the materials the way it worked its way up to him for years. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about district attorneys. In this case, of course, it was the president of Indonesia became the only person who could change the, the course of events and um, uh, he wouldn't even take our Prime Minister's call uh, if you're talking at that, at that level of, of leadership. Lex, I want to go back to um, something you brought up in your introductory r remarks uh, about a, in, an intellectual idea, you know, that, that what, what would it look like if we had people that could actually grasp it? Well, I think there are a few steps, and I, I, uh, I mean, this is really, these are just ideas that I've been tossing around since the end of April. Um, I think the government, I, I, my suspicion is, and Gillian, you'd know better than I would, but my suspicion is that the government really doesn't have a plan for any role in relation to the death penalty in these countries. And they need to be perhaps better advised than they are being advised by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, I mean, I, I remember at the end of this saga, someone was suggesting that uh, Tony Abbott and others should actually go to Indonesia and confront Jokowi and, in effect, make a personal request that these two lives be spared. And the response to that, which may have been quite valid in a diplomatic sense, was, well, it won't do any good. And my instant reaction was, we're three or four days from execution. How can it do any harm? Um, 
Mm. Now, I mean, it may have been unrealistic and the actor's video may have been a silly thing to have done, but I just think my impression of the way the Australian government reacted through this saga in the same way as in Van Nguyen was it was ad hoc. So to answer your question, Sally, my idea, which may or may not be viable, was that a group be established. If the government's got the will to really try to do something about this, that a group of, I thought, eminent persons be assembled who would devise a strategy uh, independently of government, independently of the public service, devise a strategy which the government could pursue to argue the case in Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore and all these other places and assemble the material, assemble all the material about what a, f a flawed system, uh, the system of capital punishment is, assemble all the material uh, that's been written about for years about um, the exonerations and I mean, the, just the sheer cruelty of of what goes on when someone is executed and devise a strategy that the government can then pick up and argue and then they can start their conversation. But, but uh, that, that in reality, those arguments have been available to us for decades. Yes, they have. But uh, we know that it's not a deterrent. We know that it's, uh, it's immoral and illegal to execute somebody who's mentally ill. We know that it's actually used against the impoverished and the disadvantaged. The Indonesian people don't available. know that, though, because uh, their leader's telling them something different. Well, well, that, well that may For be example. true. Mm. And, 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 but I'm trying to think mm. of the, your question about what's the sort of intellectual, what's the argument mm. or the idea? And those facts, the, the, the risk of, of, of uh, executing somebody is innocent, and of course we know that happens. The, there are ten at least reasons that you could put together that would, would provide an explanation. But I th I'm coming to the view, um, and it's a per obviously a personal view, is that what matters is political leadership. That's right. I agree. And that, that you, can, you can produce all the evidence in the world. But the United Nations General Assembly, through the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, has done some very interesting research. And where the death penalty has either been abolished completely or a moratorium is in place, or they've significantly reduced the offences to which it applies, where any of these reforms have taken place, it's almost invariably linked back to a particular political leader who's taken right. it up and then brought the public behind them. Right. And that's true, for, that goes from Mongolia. Uh, uh, recently in Malaysia, in, um, in Fiji, uh, and of course in many other parts of the world. And I think that um, I quite agree that you need that grassroots movement behind you, but I think we need to identify more political leaders that will take it up and be identified with this as an issue and stand by well, it. How do we do that? Because now, the, right yes. now the momentum has stopped. There's is no he, question the momentum has stopped. Isn't an eminent persons group, though, one way that mm. that pressure can be applied? That, the, that I think, if I'm right, Lex, you're talking about people who have access to, to leadership. Oh, and access and have the and intellectual influence. standing mm, yeah. and influence mm. um, to, and a familiarity with government and politics. Not, not to rehash those arguments, mm. but to map out a strategy that a government could use to commence the conversation at international conferences and in private representations, aside from in the context of a particular case. Mm. I mean, the, there has to be, surely, some intellectual discussion about this with governments like the Indonesian government, but aside are, from in the background of a case. Who are, I mean, I, I take Gillian's point, and I'm, I'm sure you do as well. I mean, these aren't new intellectual no. arguments. No, they're not. And, frankly, the intellectual arguments have never been what really persuades mm. people on the death penalty one way or the other. And people are persuaded by one of two things. One is values, and then they match their sense of the intellectual argument to their values. Or, and this is just my experience working in the United States, people in power there tend, not always, but tend to only understand one language, which is force. And I'm not talking about gunboats and the like, but you have to create a situation, and this isn't necessarily for the Australian government to do, but it is for the Australian people, you have to create a situation in which you apply force where it is uncomfortable to continue to carry on. You have to motivate mm. this leader. I agree with you. It takes the leadership of one or two people, but that leader has to be motivated to act in that way, and then they have to be supported. And to take the example of the mentally ill, none of these countries wants to be known for the spectacle of executing helpless, seriously disabled, mentally ill people. But we spend time talking about, you know, uh, significantly rehabilitated people, and I think that's fair enough. But that was disgraceful. 
the little bits I was able to see in the slices of the media of this poor, incredibly sick man. Yeah. Uh, the spectacle of a country of 250 million people using its force to take out and shoot this incredibly ill man. Yeah. Indonesia doesn't want to be that country. They don't want to look like that. So all you really need to do is to be able to identify that and point a spotlight at it because us telling them things isn't going to persuade anyone there of anything. Uh, you know, particularly not us. Malaysia's got more chance than Australia for obvious reasons uh, because of our unfortunate history of finger wagging and hypocrisy and those sorts yeah. of things. But I think I didn't that have finger wagging in mind. Um, <laughs> no, but enough. I mean, uh, so what does it look like then? I'm not sure what it looks like, but I think we need to have that discussion because what concerns me is that there's nothing to look at at the moment. I mean, no politician after the 29th of April said, all right, well, now, we're going to tell you now that from this point on, we are going to do in a coordinated way as a government what we can to persuade other governments not to execute people, and particularly disabled people, if you like to start with that, but generally. So here's our plan. We're going to adopt a policy, and this will be our standpoint to argue the case with these governments every opportunity we get. No one said anything like that. It happened. It was over. Joe Hockey delivered his budget. The discussion about capital punishment is gone from the Australian media. That's what concerns me. And I don't, I don't think anyone's got a plan as to how this, you know, the sort of potential you're talking about, Gillian, capitalising on the emotion and the public interest in it, is going to occur. I, I think it's, if we're not very careful, it's going to be lost. Is there anything in it politically at all for a government to take this up? Well, being principled would be a good start. <laughs> You're not very uh, well, good I, at politics, are you? I think <laughs> I'm no good at politics, no. <laughs> well, I, know, I know that's asking a lot. I'm told I'm no good at politics either, so I'm, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd rather be on the, that side of the argument than on the cynical side of the argument. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm, I think that this is an opportunity. I really do, Lex. I, I, I agree with you we need a plan. Um, but you see, politicians will respond to what they see as a public feeling, just as we've had this extraordinary change in the last few years in relation to uh, same-sex marriage. Um, the public is behind it, um, and I think the public's behind uh, the, an end to the death penalty, uh, and, and they will support those politicians who, who will be prepared to support it in the region. Um, admittedly, of course, it's different when, we're talk when we don't have the death penalty, so we're actually talking about it somewhere else. Um, but I, I quite agree that um, it, it's, it, we've had so much research on this and we know so many facts and then it's not having traction. What had traction with, with Andrew and Marin is that we got to know them over these, over these years and certainly the last few months that we got to know more about their lives and their talents and what they tried to do but we also knew that they committed a serious offence and risked the lives of many others. So, but, but Australians made their judgement and felt in the end that, that mercy was important. And if I can just add a little bit, one, what, this prompted me to go back to my uh, uh, The Merchant of Venice, uh, Shakespeare's great words and, uh, into the mouths of Portia, that cross-dressing woman, the lawyer, who, of course, appealed to the court about, you know, the quality of mercy is not strained and that mercy is something which elevates the mightiest, that, that if you're president, it's, an, it's a mark of your majesty and your power that you can be merciful. And I found there was so little discussion about mercy. Uh, and so I was very uh, keen to go back and read that speech, and I think more people should because we don't talk about it enough. But I would like to see um, a plan but I do think we've got an opportunity now, and I think it might be Tanya Plebisek or it might be the Foreign Minister, but to do it on a bipartisan basis and draw together leaders from the Australian community as well as senior politicians and, and try to find a strategy, and we can encourage them to do that. But, but I think what will make the difference is that the Australians now ha are aware of it. And, and I don't think it's dead yet. I, I think that although we've been, you know, sidelined by the, the budget and other considerations, I think Australians have been deeply moved by this story and we, we mustn't let it move, uh, get out of our grasp. We've got to take the advantage. But let me say, I mean, what that says to me, and again, you know, I'm not big on government, I'm much bigger on people and, yeah. and, and, and doing things because I don't even understand whether what we really need is elected politicians or we need senior professional public servants as our major advocates. But one thing that it says to me, if the Australian government had to do something tomorrow, one thing that it could do is fund and support organisations that are working 
in support of civil society in these countries, not exporting Australian values, working within mm -hmm. the constitutions and laws of those countries. I'm uh, a, an attorney admitted to practice in the United States, so I've held up my hand and sworn an oath to uphold the constitution of the state of Texas and uh, the United States of America to do my work there in Louisiana. Shut up, Lex. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know. uh, I'm, I'm sure you take it very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> You know, right, I'm not saying anything else. Um, but, I mean, if, no, we, if, for it. if mercy's the thing, and Lex's point is right, 60 more people may be killed before the end of the mm. year. Wouldn't one of the great things be for us to get to know those 60 people before they were shot, mm. just mm. as we got to know the others? Mm. So fund organisations that are servicing that, and I can tell you, because this is what I do for a job, we don't choose our clients and say, we're only going to go and represent these manifestly rehabilitated people mm who are of our nationality or anything like yeah. that. I mean, we take them as they come, but I can tell you from my experience, there is no one in this position who doesn't have a story to tell, who you can't develop what we call a mitigation case in America that can present the humanity of those people and hold up just how appalling it is to kill them. So let's, if the Australian government can do anything, it can support and assist organisations that can tell us about these people and then can tell us, well, where, why these 60 people and why not these other 60,000? Mm. And when let's talk about the arbitrariness of the system in some of these cases. Maybe it is something that is to do with race. Maybe it is something that is to do with politics. Maybe it is something as suggested to do with direct political corruption and bribery. Support and fund organisations that can identify and publicise those matters. And there you will provide your arguments. There's a lot of people in the United States these days who believe in the death penalty, but don't believe that their state or the federal government should have a death penalty system because whilst they like the idea, in principle, they're satisfied that it can't be run properly or isn't being run properly. And there's no reason at all that they can't be brought on board in Indonesia or Vietnam or China or anywhere else. It would need Can a I... benefactor, wouldn't mm. it? Because government yeah. aren't going to give money to that. We've got a debt and deficit crisis, which has turned into that's a doubling right. of the yeah. of the deficit, and that's all we ever hear about. Well, so yeah, unfortunately, and we good don't. Good luck with that. Mm. What happened to being but, hopeful? Mm. Well, well <laughs> I, I am hopeful. I mean, I live I'm in Louisiana. Gillian, well, well, one of the things that, that, that I've learned in this job in the last three years, although I've been a lawyer for a very long time, one thing I've really learned in a, in a, in a really sort of deep way is that laws are important. But what's really important is the cultural norm that, that executing people is wrong. And this is about uh, culture in the end, isn't it? And this is in the particularly, I'd have to say, in our region. Because, one, that's where most of the executions are taking place, both known ones and probably hundreds, if not thousands, in China. So the dimension of the problem in our region is huge. And I think the only thing that's going to change it is a shifting cultural norm that this is not... Um, this is not the way to resolve problems, and it's, it's immoral, it's dangerous, and it tends to impact only on the most disadvantaged in, in our communities. And so normative change can, it can have an impact in the, in, in the long run, and that's why I think we need, of course, we need the grassroots movements, we need leadership from there, uh, but we also need to, <coughs> to uh, get that cultural shift uh, through the media, um, and ultimately through our political representatives. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the comment you made just before too about mercy, just mm. uh, that it, um, it, it, it's missing it so missing. often, isn't mm. it? But it was there for Myron and Andrew in the mercy campaign, uh, which hundreds of thousands of, hundreds of thousands of Australians committed their signatures mm. too and it was a great word mm. Um, mm. that um, uh, and you, you reminded me of that. Um, Richard, for me the death penalty is just wrong. It's always wrong. I'm fundamentalist about it. I don't care if it's Saddam Hussein or an Indonesian maid in China. It's just always wrong. Is that the wrong attitude in realistically trying to talk um, about this with different cultures and people with different views? Should I be more incrementalist? I think there's a, the, you're talking about two different things. Um, one is, what is your personal set of values? And I think that if you're going to persuade anyone of anything, 
they need to know that you are coming from a genuine set of values that you hold and that you're not talking uh, for uh, advantage or talking out of both sides of your mouths. It's why lawyers ultimately are so rarely persuasive. It's because, you know, they take different positions depending on who's paying them or what side they're on or whatever. <laughs> you can't do that in this debate. And I think, and my experience has been, that you will be better respected if you come from a position of values. And then what you have to do, and I think that this can be hard, particularly with the emotions surrounding what's happened with these things, is you have to respect the other side. I mean, when I went to America to fight the death penalty and do this work, uh, you know, I had a set of images in my mind of pro-death penalty voters, people who were into it, jurors who would vote for death. That was very, very quickly replaced. Mm -hmm. I would go out and interview these jurors who'd sat on death cases and sit in their lounge room and talk to them. And they're you and me. They've got the same dreams mm -hmm. and aspirations. Mm -hmm. They're thoughtful, they're careful, they love their children, they want the best things for their community. We disagree about this thing, but it doesn't mean we have to be disrespectful or speak in disrespectful tones. And Australia has to be doubly careful about that when speaking in this region because it bears the burden of its past. But if you do that, I think you can say to someone, look, uh, and I should say, I agree, you have to be incrementalist in your strategy unless, and Gillian, you just know so much more about this and I defer to you on it, unless you're at a tipping point where these governments are willing to say, oh, all right, we'll get rid of it, you're incrementalist in your strategy and you can go and say to the president of Indonesia, look, as you know, we're opposed to the death penalty in all circumstances and that's our position and we voted out the Prime Minister who was high-fiving that whole Bali thing and we, we won't do that again. Uh, but we understand that you have that and you understand that that's not our position and we would like you to change that and we hope you come to that view. Whilst we disagree on that, I wonder if we could agree on one thing, that maybe we could look at saying that the people who are very mentally ill, we should carve that out more effectively than it's currently done, or we're looking at this information that suggests this incredible arbitrariness, and we would like to help work with you on that. Perhaps we could have a moratorium whilst we examine that problem, because I think even though you support the death penalty and we don't, we can both agree that if you're going to have it, it shouldn't be arbitrary or it shouldn't be racist or it shouldn't prey upon the mentally infirm. So I think having the sound set of values is an excellent starting point for a conversation about incremental change. Well, you've raised, I think, a fascinating question because the United Nations General Assembly has adopted this incrementalist approach. Uh, as a matter of international law, the death penalty is not illegal. Um, what it's done is to say that it should be preserved only for the most serious crimes. But it, again, it's carved out in relation to those that are mentally ill, and etc. cetera. Um, but one could challenge that by saying, is this really the right approach, this incrementalist approach? And, and I favoured going for a moratorium first as a, as a way of working in the region, and I suspect that's practical. But one could argue, and I have seen it argued, that the UN should take a much stronger lead in saying it's simply illegal as a matter of international law. It constitutes in the way it's executed um, as cruel and unusual punishment, and it's contrary to the <coughs> Convention Against Torture, and it's contrary to the right to life in the International Covenant. Now, sadly, um, I find in my job, citing those treaties and those provisions of, of various international agreements or UN resolutions cuts almost no ice in Australia at all, very, very sadly, partly because those treaties are not part of Australian law. But I think you've raised a fascinating point that strategically, um, should you just go for the strong position, the, that, that it's deeply morally wrong and should be legally wrong, uh, or do you take an incrementalist approach? And certainly at the Australian Human Rights Commission, at the moment, we're trying to persuade and work with um, other national human rights bodies <coughs> in the region to uh, talk about a moratorium, because we think that's something that we could all agree to and provide some leadership role with. I just wanted to add this, that um, I think one of the strategies that's worth thinking about is to tap into those um, sections of the Indonesian community, particularly the legal community, who are in fact against the death penalty. Uh, for example, um, in the constitutional case that was conducted some years ago now, a majority, um, sorry, a minority judgment was published which in effect recommended um, that there be a delay of 10 years after the death penalty had been imposed. And that if, if at the end of that 10 years that particular prisoner had 
significantly rehabilitated that the death penalty would then be commuted. Now there's quite a strong view amongst quite a few people of influence in Indonesia that the death penalty is wrong, that we should at least have a moratorium, or they should, um, and that the way it's been done in the last year or two is obviously not acceptable to them. We need, I think, to understand more about the influence of those people and try to tap into their influence. And I, I mean, I have the scepticism of international human rights instruments of only someone who practices in the United States can have because, <laughs> yes. I mean, you, you think it, you don't get far citing that in Australia. You want to see what happens when you cite that in Louisiana. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> no, no, they true. don't care no. and they're not mm. going to change. And in fact, a top-down approach from the UN would only be inflammatory when, a, when the US was found to be violating the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Uh, uh, you know, a treaty to which it is a signatory and which is meant to be adopted uh, uh, as law. You know, the state of Texas executed prisoners in defiance of a United States presidential request slash order, the lawyers are still arguing as to what its status is, not to do so. And they said, no, we're mm. not going to let the UN or some Vienna Convention or the President of the United States tell us we can't do it, we're Texas and we're going to kill them, and they did, and they still do. And so, you know, I could wish for a time when uh, it was implemented into international law that the death penalty was illegal, but, you know, I don't know how many, how many body bags get filled until that happens, and I just, you know, if, if that's not going to work in the United States, uh, which admittedly is a country less likely to be influenced by that the most, mm. uh, I'm not saying it's not worth trying for, but um, I wouldn't want to put all my eggs in that basket. No, I, know I, you're I, wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that, that but, yeah. but, um, but I think we have to try every angle. And yeah. if you get leadership in the international community with some basic standards, then, and then you work at the grassroots level to build up those normative practices, then some, somewhere they must start to meet. And I think there's evidence that they are. I mean, the, the, there are, I think, 160 states have now um, abolished the... Uh, the death penalty. I mean, that is a huge advance. We, we have to be uh, somewhat practical in, in recognising the advances that have been made. But I, I think what I find rather distressing, it's, it's, it's our part of the world where mm. this is really the live problem, apart, um, unfortunately, the, right. the, uh, for the United States and, of course, parts of the Middle East, and obviously Saudi Arabia is another major country, but it's our region where we don't have that, um, uh, that, those, those developments in quite the way that we should. And, and I think that that's where Australia's got some opportunity to um, facilitate a, 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 a consensus development uh, so that those countries who don't want to be seen as cruel right. and, uh, and acting inappropriately in the 21st right. century, there are various arguments that we, one can make that appeal to them. So I think we've got an opportunity, I think, now to pull all these threads together and to work in the region positively to, to, to move to a moratorium. So who will do that? <laughs> I've got my hands full, Lex. I, 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 do, I, do, I, do, I do, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have a few other problems. But I, 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 we, we're going to try with national human rights bodies, yeah, well, um, and, and that's fine. We're not yep. huge and we're not enormously influential, but we're there. We're, we, we're between government and, the, and civil society. Why not the judges? Um, oh, well. Why yeah. not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's... They're I've not already, allowed to. I've already just broken for starters. He's far already more in rules enough than trouble. I to yeah. uh, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely. But uh, look, I agree. wouldn't that be wonderful yes, if it would our be. Chief Justice um, said... Yeah. Well, our Chief Justice, our Victorian Chief Justice, has done exactly that. She has been absolute. The reason mm. that yeah. I was free to do the things that I did, not that I did that much, was that she supported me. And uh, mm. there's no question. She is committed to this cause. And indeed, after I raised this idea on the 7.30 report, she came to me and said, I've got some ideas about how this could work. She's talking to the Australian Bar Association and some other groups mm. like that to see how we can mm. progress it. So I, you're right, judges ought to be involved. Judges, These are things that judges should be publicly interested in. And how interesting recently that we've seen the medical profession come in on, on some of these issues. What about bringing the professions well, together? Well, they've been so important in America, haven't they? Right, mm. of course, with the you know, lethal mm. injection mm. and the, the medical profession drew a line many years ago and then the, uh, the pharmacists now are, are drawing a line and saying we're not part of that either. The drug companies, I mean, it's been described mm. by some justices of the, the Supreme Court as uh, anti-death penalty guerrilla warfare 
to say to a drug company, are you sure you want your healing mm. medicines used mm. to kill people and have them say, no, is that what they're doing? And that's apparently that's guerrilla mm. warfare. All it is <laughs> is <laughs> democracy in action. Yes. You know, uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a free society. But I think that in doing that, uh, I mean, I think the leadership of the judges in many ways is probably most important in galvanising the uh, Australian populace and providing leadership for the Australian community who do feel uh, strongly about this and providing that leadership supports our political leadership as well. But coming back to uh, what you'd been talking about, Gillian, in terms of the changes, I agree, we have to be very positive. I mean, we're winning this. It's one mm -hmm. of the things that's mm -hmm. so dispiriting about each execution that takes place mm -hmm. now, whether in the United States or in this region, because there is a very strong sense that they will be some of the last. Mm, that's right. And, some of the, and so it makes it worse that that's happening. But I'm, because I can't influence laws and change laws, I, I've tried, it didn't work. Um, <laughs> I'm a great believer in using the ones that we've got and they often don't look that good. But, you know, we talk about changing human rights instruments to make them abolitionist rather than incrementalist. Mm -hmm. But to the extent that they say, don't execute the mentally ill, coming back to Sally's point, that's in the Indonesian constitution, yet it happens, it's a lot easier for someone like me, instead of changing the law to make it abolitionist, to take that law and prove by evidence rather than argument mm. that that is happening. Mm. And, you know, I'm a great believer in evidence rather than argument because no one cares what I say. Where I work now, no one cares what I think. No one cares what I say, but if I can prove something by facts then that matters. Mm. And that's why I come back to what I'd said earlier. We've already got a lot of tools to force an incrementalist uh, approach and a moratorium approach simply by proving that the existing laws are not being subscribed to. We've got time for a couple of questions. So if you would like to ask one, put your hand in the air. And if someone puts a microphone in it, start talking straight away. <laughs> okay. Um, you started by saying that you thought Australia had credibility to speak against the death penalty in other countries. Um, I Advantages, <laughs> not credibility. Okay. Um, but still, I dispute that because um, of our treatment of asylum seekers and the killing and detention, offshore processing. And, um, yeah, I think that jeopardises our credibility. Yeah. I agree. I mean, we, we don't have credibility because we're a bastion of human rights. We've got our own skeletons that aren't even in the closet, you know, that they're right out there. And so that is a, a, a problem. We can't go and say we're on the moral high ground, we do everything right. I think one of the greatest advantages we've got in talking about the, the death penalty in the region is that we have successfully experimented with abolition. There hasn't been an execution in this country since before I was born. And it's okay. We're all okay. We don't need the death penalty and nor does anyone else in this region. And that ultimately is probably the most persuasive thing that a country identified so heavily as being uh, hypocritical on human rights and being a predominantly Anglo-white country in the Southeast Asian region can do by way of providing evidence rather than argument. And the other aspect of the evidence is to bearing in mind that these last two execute or these last um, uh, seven or eight executions were all about the so-called war on drugs is to pose the question, well, how's the war going? Mm. Um, we've got um, all these people who've been killed in a firing squad. How's the drug problem? Um, and I mean, that's what... I'm we're sure it's about much Richard. better now. <laughs> yes. Mm. Uh, I mean, that's it, just evident, an analysis of, well, the death penalty is said to be uh, a deterrent to drug trafficking and drug use. Well, is it working? And the, I'm sure the evidence will demonstrate that it's not. Well, I think that's a terrific question, and it's a very important one, because Australia is just coming up for its second universal periodic review before oh. the Human Rights Council. And that issue of our treatment of asylum seekers and our uh, attempt to... Um, uh, avoid our duty of care to them and our responsibilities to them as refugees will be questioned. But perhaps I could turn your question around a little to say uh, I was in Geneva recently talking to um, the various um, human rights bodies and one of the things that really struck me was that representatives, particularly from our region, were saying 
they weren't attacking me or Australia. They were saying we're completely bemused by Australia's or confused by Australia's behaviour because we have traditionally been good international citizens. Mm -hmm. We have been leaders in human rights historically, uh, but our asylum seeker policy really challenges that view of Australia and why are we doing it? Why is this country that's had open arms and been so generous and, and is a leader in every other aspect of human rights. Why are we doing it? And what I'd suggest that that uh, suggests to me is that we do have a high level of credibility uh, in the region. And we are expected, and I was told this by Indonesia and by China and the Philippines and Vietnam, they expect us to lead. Now, we have to be careful about that because we don't want to be deputy sheriffs. But at the same time, we do have a reputation, and I do believe that we could build on it in an appropriately sensitive way. We can do it. But I equally accept your point that we are seriously under challenge for our policies in relation to asylum seekers. So it's not the end of the day that... that I mean, that's true, but it's not the end of the day because... We all hate people who are right all the time, right? You don't want to take advice from someone who's right all the time and has got it all together. To be able to sit down at a table and say, man, this stuff's hard, isn't it? We're really making a mess of the asylum thing. But here's an easy one we can fix. Can we work together on an easy one? That's not bad. Well, I like that argument. I think that could work. Oh, that's... No one's ever going to accuse Australia of being perfect at the moment, are they? That's a wild, wild thought, Richard. That mm. I like your thinking. I, I remember someone asking, Richard, it must be when you first went over. I think it might have been an interview. Um, and they said, now, Mr Burke, why is it that you are so strongly opposed to the death penalty? And he said, because I hate it when governments kill people. Um, it was such a terrific answer. Mm. And, I mean, that's, that's at the centre of the debate. It is. We'll, it we'll is. I'm more. Howdy. Um, I just wanted to preface my question by saying I'm 100% supportive of everything you guys are doing, but I just wanted maybe to see if you could weigh in on where victims fit into this whole argument. And Richard, maybe um, you've had a exposure to some victims and, um, yeah, could speak a little bit more about that. Sure. It's, it's a fascinating thing for me uh, because the only cases I do in the US are murder cases because that's what you get the death penalty for over there. There isn't this drug trafficking stuff that you get the death penalty for. And so there are victims. There are the families of those who've been killed. And in our work, they're a critical part of what we do. Their voice is heard. In fact, they are often the arbiter of whether the elected district attorney is going to seek death in a case, whether they want death or not. And we attempt to deal as respectfully as possible uh, with the families of victims. We attempt to reach out to them. And we've often been very successful in creating a bridge between uh, the families of victims and uh, those who have killed their loved ones. And we've uh, participated in uh, reconciliation meetings. That's a strong word, reconciliation, uh, just as the word forgiveness is. We've had uh, victims' family members who have pushed for our clients not to receive death not having forgiven that person, but having come to that view. And so uh, we are very conscious of the situation of victims. One thing that's true in every single case that we're involved in is that someone's been killed and a lot of people have been hurt by that. And uh, it's something that we're very respectful of. Uh, we have in-house trainings for our staff. We have victim survivors come and talk to us about what it's like and what we can do about the way we conduct ourselves in our job to be as respectful as possible of the position and the suffering of victims while we're doing what we have to do. It's harder to, uh, you can't sort of lay a glove on that with where the victim is the war on drugs. It makes it very no, difficult. No, but, but it's there. Um, and certainly I got some, a fair bit of pushback on Twitter in relation to people who said, yeah, well, what would have happened if they hadn't been executed? They would have come back to Australia, trafficked their eight kilograms of heroin and caused misery and death uh, all over the country. Um, so there's a real victim issue in relation to drug trafficking, although I must say one of the most moving things I saw uh, this year was at the vigil at uh, Federation Square when the gentleman whose name I forget now uh, got up to make a, a speech in favour of mercy for uh, Andrew Chan and Maran Sukumaran and his son had overdosed on heroin in his early to mid-twenties. And he compared what he had lost um, by his son now being dead with what he was concerned that the parents of Myron and Andrew would lose 
when they were executed. And it was a most moving moment and a powerful piece of evidence about forgiveness and compassion and restorative justice and all the rest of it. So there is an issue uh, in relation to victims, victims of the drug trade as well as victims of, of homicide. And uh, uh, they obviously are involved and they need to have a voice in this discussion. But I think you'll find that quite a large number of people who would regard themselves as victims see the execution of the offender as a futile and somewhat inhumane act. Just thank one more time Richard Burke, Gillian Triggs and Lex Lazarus. <laughs>